Yes or no? You know, I could have okay. <laughs> Yeah, don't want me to take that down. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for asking me, Matt. And uh, hopefully you guys agreed to this. If not, I, I hope, uh, yeah, you're prepared. So I don't speak a lot. I figure I can come and, and give my testimony. Matt, Matt asked me uh, about that a while ago. I think originally I was supposed to speak when brother Larry came out and then Larry said he would, and you were far better off with Larry than me. So I, uh, of course waited and said I'd come out in the spring. So also, if you didn't notice, I'm not a very good singer, definitely not a loud one. Uh, so I heard, sorry to disappoint. We had some strong singers here from what I heard on the last, uh, meeting. So especially brother Bob McKay, uh, but you guys do a wonderful job here in the piano. I, I liked it. And uh, I, I like the hymns. I didn't come from assemblies. I did. Uh, I'm very new to this. My wife and I and um, both grew up in probably evangelical churches, I guess. In fact, I'll get into the story details, but <clears throat> not a story, the truth details, the uh, account. And uh, I, I, it, I love the assemblies as we've been coming to learn a lot in the last couple years and and just the intimacy of the small smaller chapels um this would be probably a bible study at, at a church that we came from so to get to know folks in this way it's uh it's refreshing it, it is a change sometimes it's intimidating standing here and uh everybody knows you you know you go to a, a place where they know you and i think there's good there's a lot of good in that the, the accountability there the folks we're, we, everyone's serving we're pitching in so uh, i'll i'll start by saying i'm not blasphemous here okay i know we can only be saved once uh it's a little bit of my my story i feel like obviously i was saved uh at one point but you'll see I was a backslider. I struggled. Um, and then I feel like, and I'll get into the details, that, that the Lord redeemed my marriage and redeemed my family and was able to, I was able to ask for forgiveness and walk a path, um, a different path. And so I, uh, I grew up, I guess, normal. What's normal these days? But <clears throat> I came from a family, grew up in, in California, near the, the, the chapel, but in Claremont, but a little bit down the road in, in a town called Pomona. So, you know, I guess you would say south of the train tracks, uh, maybe, or, or, or whatever we grew up. I don't think we were poor, but we, we had a, um, a mile, you know, my dad was a working, working guy. He, he was a um, heavy equipment operator and my mom and mom and dad got married early. And then I didn't know I, I was a kid and I didn't know they weren't saved. I didn't know anything about anything really. So I figured it was normal for a few years. And then around eight years old, um, we, they got divorced. And I remember that being a pivotal uh, part in my life where it changed a lot of things. And, you know, there's generational sin uh, that, that comes in. They didn't know about that either because they were just doing what they, that what they thought was right. And then, and then, you know, as the world tells you, Hey, I don't feel like I'd be want to be with this person. I'm out of here. Right. So <clears throat> I had, there was, divorce, uh, some abuse, uh, you know, even, even my dad struggled with, with alcoholism. I didn't know that he was, he was pretty rough on me as a kid. I, I know when he got angry, he would, he would get to hitting. And, and, um, so he was pretty rough. Uh, I realized my mom tried, um, you know, she took us to church again, not believers. Why did, why did she take us to church? She knew there was something about that. Right. And so I grew up in a disciples church, disciples of Christ, I think there's some similarities. It's a smaller uh, congregation and there, and people get to know you. I had some, some people in my life that I, I really heard the gospel or at least learned about God. I don't know if I remember hearing, I know I heard about Jesus. I know I heard, I, I don't remember a lot, but I, I remember it being fun. I remember going there that, you know, there was a pastor. I grew up even in the youth group. Um, and then at age in those churches at age, I think it's, 
12, 13, you, you just go kind of like in the Catholic church. You just go through the motions, you do the thing, you say the, the words, you study uh, almost like a catechism, and, and then uh, you get baptized on this specific Sunday at this age, and you just, and they say, do you know, do, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And I say, yo, yes. And then everybody, it's great. I, I don't think I made that decision at that time. So, <clears throat> and I clearly, my actions did not show that. Um, the divorce was tough, I think, getting, growing up in that uh, rough family, I think. Uh, my dad walking out on us uh, was, was a big deal. Um, I, later on in my life, I, I, I will see that in, as kind of a blessing in disguise, knowing that I, I could never do that to my family. And I know what that does to a family, what divorce and th that destruction is. And I'm not judging anyone from here. If you come from divorce or you have, are struggling in that way, I, 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 it's, but it is it is a detrimental thing that happens to a family, um, no matter what comes of that. And, and so, uh, again, that, that second redemption after I got saved and then Lord, uh, I think redeeming my marriage, um, that was some of that part of that looking back. I don't think I'd change anything at this point. I mean, there's things I, I kind of look back and, oh, I wish I experienced that or I wish I experienced this. But I don't know that I would change it because it, it put me here. The Lord had a path for me even to, to have me here today. Um, but there was a lot of sin in that family, both sides of my, my mom and, and dad. And, and even, I don't want to speak out of turn for my wife, but we both came from broken homes actually. And, and just the, the, what, what happens in that way, I'm sure if I went back a couple generations in my dad's side, there was probably a believer somewhere. All right, I don't know if it was great grandpa, uh, Charles Kurtek senior. Um, I always put the third and it's almost like a joke because there's this point where I don't want to be associated with junior or senior. You know, I, I met my grandpa over the phone. Actually, we met him when I was little, little. I don't remember this, but I talked to him on, on the phone when he was on his deathbed and he called me. He said, hey, this is uh, Chuck Sr. And I, I, I'm on my, you know, I'm, I'm dying. And I heard you're, I heard you're a Marine. That's good. I was in the Navy. Okay. Well, it was nice meeting you, grandpa. And that was it. And then I, he passed away a couple of days later and, and I never got to know him. I not, never not to know the joys of multi-generations of believers and the fruit that comes from that. Um, I feel like we get a glimpse of it, though, when we're in an assembly like this or, or at, at Claremont where we see families together and, and several generations of families. There's so many blessings that come from that. So I, I'm not here to preach. I'm just here to say that's what I saw. I saw the uh, ugly side of of sin and divorce and destruction that, and even in with the addiction and the things that happened there. And then it set me up to be a rebellious teen. We, we have good teenagers. Uh, my kids are wonderful kids um, and they are saved. They were saved at a young age and they're still teenagers and they still do things that, um, you know, teenagers do, but to set up a teenager uh, with no, no father in the house and just send them, let allow them to go out into the world as a young man. I was not ready for that, but I tried. I thought, uh, well, I don't want anything to do with this family life. I'm going to go out and run, run around in the streets and, and do what I want. I'm from a very young age, uh, age of 13. I probably 12, 13 had my first cigarette and started other things in junior high school that kids should not even be exposed to ever. Uh, but I was, there was just, my mom tried her best. She was, um, we're trying to work three, four jobs. When my dad left, he, he didn't pay child support. He worked other jobs to make sure he didn't have to pay child support. So she had to do what she had to do. And, and I don't blame her. And again, back to that church thing, she thought, oh, well, if they're in church, they'll probably be okay. And, and, and in some ways she's right. At some point that set me up to at least know where to go and, and the choice I needed to make. But she unfortunately still hasn't made that choice. Um, so there's some things that I just, I look back, uh, it doesn't matter probably if I, if I, uh, I would have been a sinner anyway. I was, I still am. <laughs> but before I was saved at that time uh, in high school, especially, I, I just, I was doing things that no one should do. I was experiencing things that no teen, no grown man should ever, ever do. And, and get, I mean, from, the amount of just rebelliousness. I don't need to go through the laundry list, but there were more things that I tried and experienced from at 14 and 15 that I hope my kids never experience. I hope that any young person here never experienced and hopefully anyone else has an experience, but it, it, it was, it was, I was going full speed off the cliff at, at, at the age of 15. I had already been 
you know, caught with a car I shouldn't have been driving and picked up by the cops. I mean, it was starting to become, I could have been that statistic. And, and I was quickly going to the, to become that statistic living in, in the, you know, more poorer part of town, mom, never around latchkey kid it just fits the mold. You read about it. You're like, well, of course. Yeah, that's fine. And then the system will take care of this kid. You know, <clears throat> uh, I actually did uh, not only get pulled over, I was still a teenager. So all this stuff is uh, prior to being 18 and no longer exists on my record. So I can go ahead and say these things. Uh, uh, but, you know, I, 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 I did. I was, I mean, I was picked up by the cops because what my mom couldn't control me. What, what's she going to do? Uh, I mean, the only thing left is jails, institution and death. And you'll probably hear me quote some things from other rooms that, that I, that helped me save, get, get me to the point of saving my family. Um, but l l let me tell you what happened here. I don't need to, like I said, no laundry list, but I was saved at 17. <clears throat> I had grown up in this church. I had grown up knowing about the Lord, knowing there was something about the small community of, of believers who were doing good and it felt good and there were good people, but I hadn't made that decision, and it clearly, uh, by my actions, was not not something I had had done. And I was invited by a neighbor uh, one one evening, and we had gone to this smaller church, and that's kind of what we knew. And I even got involved with with youth group and church camp, and even was a, a, a you know a youth counselor, and and started doing different things. But I had I hadn't experienced, I think. Maybe I heard, I didn't hear it, or maybe I heard it and didn't listen. But that that gospel message, I I heard it at a Calvary Chapel in Diamond Bar, <clears throat> and the pastor was Raul Reese. And if you don't know who he is, I just recently discovered he was also Marine, which is funny as I become a Marine later in life. And he and he has an amazing story, and I'm not here to tell his story, but it was, it, there were some similarities there. He was on the brink of some things, and, and the Lord saved him, and he has been a champion for the Lord ever since, 60-something years old, you know, 40-plus years a believer, and then he's been on fire for the Lord with ministries that all over the world. But anyway, Raul Reese, a pastor from Calvary Chapel, whom I have never listened to after, never heard of before, never really even talk about him except for a handful of times when I talk about my testimony, but he gave a message that day that I don't remember. I don't remember at all, but I know that I was convicted. I know that I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing, and there was something else out there. The thing, the Jesus that I knew, the Lord that I knew as a kid, that was my answer, and I answered that altar call. So I went up in the front of this big old church. And if you don't know about some of these big Calvary churches, they're massive. We're talking thousands of people. So, uh, but it's like they didn't exist. I was hearing from Raul Reese. Well, I was hearing from the Lord through Raul Reese. And I answered that altar call and, and got saved. And I'd like to say, <clears throat> that's it. And everything else was easy from there, right? Um, but we all know, in the, even in the best circumstances, that's that's not how it works. And so I quickly um, began, I thought maybe I should go in the military. I, I didn't have a dad around. There was a lot of things that I was focused on still in the world, and I didn't have this good foundation. Um, you know, I ended up meeting the love of my life, and I can start to tell you, here's where the alcohol and the past exposures from when as a teenager started to really come into play in my early twenties. And if you don't know about alcoholism and, and some of those things, there's a lot of peaks and valleys. And so I would be on these real good highs. I was on fire for the Lord. If I was serving at church camp and I was doing this and I was disciplined in all these ways, but it just took that one drink and that one group of friends and that one time where I'm going to just yeah, I'll go out and, and, uh, you'll hear this in other rooms of recovery, but uh, one drink was too many and one more is never enough, ever. And so I'm the kind of guy who's all in. And, and that is my personality. I think there's ways that the Lord made, made me and makes us that strengths. And, and now later in life, I see those same strengths being used in, in a good way. But be, not having that foundation, not, not getting discipled, and I'm not blaming anyone, I didn't seek it out. I wasn't, I didn't know what to do and where to go. I just thought, well, these, I should just go this way. I should just, this is what the world thinks is good, so I'm going to go. I didn't have those spiritual disciplines. I didn't have any discipline, really, and I thought the military was the answer. So 
I chose the branch that would hit me the hardest and have the longest boot camp and be the toughest on me. So the Marine Corps was the only place I was going to go. And uh, it worked in some ways. It did, did smack me upside the head and, and give me a, a good direction. I'm still that way, uh, actually. I still, the Lord uses a two by four, I think, often. And uh, sometimes it needs a couple whacks. Um, so that that's okay. You know, I think, I think that, um, and I'm learning slowly, but surely later on here in life, but the good thing is in one of those good moments when I was serving and doing everything right, I think I had some clarity. I was uh, blessed to meet the love of my life, my wife, Sherry. And I knew from the time that I met her that, that I was going to marry her because there's something about her. She was, she is, um, one of the most godly women I've ever met, um, most disciplined, most uh, just, I'm not here to just dote on my wife, but I will tell you, she is, um, the Lord bless me. He really did. And uh, later on, <laughs> so all that was great. It's all good. And, and, and you, you know, again, I'd like to say that was the fairy tale, right? I knew what I had in front of me and it's just going to work to make that the best thing I could do. But <clears throat> that alcohol kept sneaking up on me. That all, it kept following me. That addiction, no matter how you stop, they say, they being, I don't know, experts, it follows you. As I grow, it grows. I can be as good as I want. If I take a drink for me, I take a drink today, it'll be back as if I drank for the last 42 years. It doesn't matter. So I don't take, I haven't had a drink, praise God, since 2008. Well, we got married and, and had kids right out of the gate and both coming from broken homes. We decided to elope and we were just going to do it our own way. And we're going to do it differently than we, our parents ever did. And that's just how we've in a lot of good ways. Still, we do it differently than our parents did, but we were just going to go and we, we, uh, and we did that. So we uh, were blessed with twins right out of the gate. So again, I hadn't even held, held a baby before that. Um, I don't remember ever. My wife has had a baby on her hip since she was a, a little girl. She's always the, the mom, the mama hen of the, the cousins. And so thank God for her because I didn't know what I was doing uh, at all. But then we, and we had the, the twins and, and we had Jack. And so I'm a young family in my, my early twenties. Um, and I think again, well, I didn't, I don't know. I just need to make money. I just need to be successful. I need to give us that house. I need to hurry up and, and do all these things. And so again, my foundation I had already a terrible foundation, but I didn't know enough. I didn't seek to, to get that, build it up, uh, whether, you know, obviously in the Lord, right? And, and, and being a, a good godly father, a biblical father and, and a husband. And I just thought, well, if I work harder and more, I can do more stuff for my family, the stuff that the world says we should have, whatever that is. And... <clears throat> Unfortunately, in that, that alcohol kept still rearing its head. I thought, well, if I can drink with the boss, and I don't know how many nights I would say, well, you know, I'll be home late. I'm, I'm with the boss. We're, 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 we're doing, uh, you know, net networking. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, Mark, Mark, we're talking about work, and I'm going to promote this way. Um, I'm sure I had a thousand excuses at the time, which I did. There's always an excuse. You'll, you know, if you know any addicts or alcoholics, we have them all, every excuse that you have ever wanted I, and more, you know, and, and I have to be careful because I still that that same thing. Now I have those excuses, even when I know I should be reading my Bible instead of looking at the news or whatever dumb thing that I'm looking at instead of uh, having being disciplined in the morning. Right. And that still eats at me, though I haven't had a drink since 08. I almost lost it all again. I think it took to, to bring me to my knees. Uh, thank the Lord, my wife left me. Now you look back there, she's still here. <laughs> but that was after some, some major changes. Uh, I didn't know at the time in 07, so the kids were two, Jack was just born. And she had been talking to another family member who had some experience with alcoholism and other things. And, and she decided to get some help and she got some good counsel that said, listen, you need to draw a line. And she drew that line and said, you either choose alcohol or me, and I'll give you that. You can make that choice. And, and I'm going to go stay with my aunt. And we're, we're going we're gonna to figure this out, but you have to make that choice. And I stayed, I stayed alone in that house thinking about that choice for weeks. That's how dumb I am. That's how hard-headed I am. It, <laughs> Thank you. 
I, again, that's why the message I say twice redeemed, I'm not saved again in that way, but he saved me that, that when I said that prayer, when I got on my knees, finally with another man who was a believer and also an alcoholic and said, you need to, you need to get on your knees and you need to get, you need to get right with the Lord. You, you have been cut off from the spirit for all this, these years or many different times. You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with the alcohol spirit at the same time. And that is a problem. And I hope that no one here is struggling with that, but if maybe there's somebody who you have in your family and, or if it's maybe for you today, this message that you cannot be filled up with the Holy Spirit and with alcohol spirit at the same time. And of course, I'm not up here to tell you, you can't have a drink of alcohol. There's plenty of folks who can have a glass of wine or a, a beer and, and not be drunk or a drunkard. And that's okay uh, in, in certain contexts and whatever, but I cannot. And I know there's a lot of folks who cannot. They have that addictive personality. I, I can get addicted to serving. I can get addicted to, uh, you know, I'll tell you the rescue team. I was on the sheriff's rescue team for years and I did. I like that adventure. I like that adrenaline so i can get addicted to, addicted to that i like to shoot i like to hunt you know any of that i can be so i need to be addicted to the lord first and and i do have to remember that but the lord saved redeemed my marriage and my family and i remember saying a prayer that same that prayer that i'm talking about i won't remember it off the top of my head but it's it's a prayer that you pray to for forgiveness and to ask the lord to, to please help me to get back on on track and some things you kind of open up with the lord but I was with another believer and we were at a Starbucks in a very busy location in, in, in Upland near, near Claremont uh, on a Saturday morning. We had been meeting two men, you know, he, helping me through these things. And he said, well, why don't we just pray real quick right now? I said, oh, okay. You know, and he said, well, let's get on our knees right now, right here, right now. Yeah. Right here, right now. Let's just, you mean, you're serious. Let's do it. And it was by the time I didn't even say yes, it was already on my knees praying with this man to save my marriage and family to Lord, forgive me, please remove this sin from my life and I need it. That's how desperate I was. I was willing to get on my knees in front of all the cars passing a Foothill Boulevard Route 66 and, and be on my knees. I don't know if I've ever got on my knees like that uh, again. And, and I, I actually hope that I don't have to, uh, but, but I felt like that was the point where I was so desperate. I needed the Lord and he brought me to my knees literally. And thank God he did. <clears throat> because there, it was a struggle, and it's still a struggle. But I tell you, there, <laughs> I still, these big sins, we all struggle with, I'm sure, but, but I know for me, it was amplified. Anger, pride, selfishness, those are things that I still have to fight today. And the only way is the Lord Jesus, obviously, and, and, and using, you know, the word is uh, the, what, what I need to turn to, and I need other men with accountability. And, and there's things um, that I do now, uh, and, and even in a smaller chapel, when we get to, um, well, I'll, I'll keep going here. I don't want to get, so I'm not a professional speaker and I don't speak a lot, but I can speak. I, I can speak. Uh, if I get off topic and it's not of me, oh, I can run for hours. So uh, I will make, that's what I, I didn't really want this PowerPoint, but I, this is for me to keep me on the track. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> so um, right here, he opened my eyes to this. And, and this is something that I, I can be blinded. That I have the greatest gift from the Lord and this wife that I have and these beautiful kids. And I, at the time, was just blinded by alcohol and, and other sin. It's just, and it can happen so fast. So I thank the Lord. And this is us, I think, last year, our first, probably our first Easter at the chapel, I think. And, um, you know, we haven't arrived. It's not easy. Uh, but in, in the Lord, if my joy is in the Lord and my trust is in the Lord, it's easier. I can't, I know what the end is. I know what the, what the end of the story will be. And it doesn't even mean that it, we might not see some really hard things. We had a hard year. We had a last, the hard year, couple years. Uh, my wife lost her mom last year and, and it was a really hard fight with cancer and it was really hard for her. And uh, the Lord, you know, 
I thank God that the Lord had me here with her because if he had, if I had not got on my knees, I would not be here for any of those things. And, and, and even the hurts, I think um, we can't have the joy without the hurts. And again, my joy, our joy is and trust is in the Lord. And sometimes it's hard to sit and I feel like it's hard to sit in, in, in hardship and, and sickness and, and whatever tragedy that surrounds you and remember that. But I do remember that is my hope where my, where my hope is. <clears throat> so I, I'd like to go, you know, the last part, there's a lot of joy and there's a lot of great things the Lord has done. And in fact, I feel like that, that second chance I got, I like to go back to that second chance I got when we had, we were involved in a church and, and then we kind of moved into another church because there were some things going on there that it was dissolving. And, and when we found this other church prior to Claremont Bible Chapel, we were, we were all in, I said, I'm all in for the Lord. I've done this wrong before and I need to be all in. And I need to be, if we're going to be there, I need to be all in with whatever it is, serving, uh, you know, cleaning, <laughs> whatever the task is. And so we jumped in fast at, at our prior, prior uh, church. And, and we were there, I think, eight years, if, if I remember right. It was a good amount of time. We, we established some things. And the Lord really worked on me as, as, a, as a father and, and a husband. And I, I firmly believe we were there for me. I, I don't know. Toward the end, I had to look back and, and see where, where my kids growing, uh, where, where my, did that, didn't I? Sorry. Uh, where my kids growing was my wife growing, and that's really up to me. I didn't know that. I was I was sitting at a place where I thought, well, the church should be, make having growing my kids, and the church should be growing my wife. No, no, no. That's my job as a husband to lead that to help my wife grow and my kids. And and I still have a hard time with that. Again, back to. It doesn't matter what the excuse is. I need, I need to get better at that. I need to continue in that. But there were some blessings that something the Lord put on my heart at that church and, and in these recent years is, uh, is serving and in, in, in international missions and serving um, and supporting workers overseas and, and what that means. And so I think that when he made it clear. And I, I was actually the missions coordinator at the, our previous church. And so I led some teams and led some trips to Africa and Central America and, and Thailand. And I feel like the passion that uh, the Lord gave me for that, um, I, I know that there's going to be some more done with that. Uh, I thought maybe I'd be on the mission field in the last couple of years. I was up and ready to move my family. This is what alcoholics do. We're just ready, all in, let's go. I don't even think about any of the consequences. We're going to take my wife and kids and just go to wherever. I want to go to Thailand. I'm going to go to Africa. Let's go. And uh, again, the voice of reason, the beautiful wife I had back there was like, okay, but is this of the Lord? Are we, are we in prayer? Are we? So we sat, we said, okay, let's pray. Well, we'll pray for uh, three months straight. Every night we'll pray about the what, what the Lord has for our family. Are we going to serve? Because we did get the opportunity to take our family to Thailand. I think my kids will tell you they fell in love with Thailand and and uh, and Laos and Burma. And um, the time there was was amazing. We got to go see this specifically was um, some believers who up in, in Myanmar, Burma, who, who are cut off from everything, essentially. You can't be an open believer, really, uh, in, in Myanmar still. And um, their struggles, we got to see the hospital that was made of plywood and, and the, the, you know, the folks that they had there that are fighting their civil war. And it just, just to be able to, to go there and then even just encourage the believers. We, we were part of a medical team. I have some uh, medical background as a medic EMT when I was on the, the rescue team with the sheriff's department. And, and um, I kept that going a little for a little while. So I was doing some of that, but um. What really drew me actually was something that has, I think, solidified my faith is the sacrifice of early missionaries and, and even the apostles and, and the idea that just saying I knew the Lord Jesus was a death sentence. That to me, it, in all of the times we, where I, and maybe you haven't struggled, but I, I'm definitely one who, who's, you know, early in my faith, I think had, had some really hard questions. Well, how can this be true? Or is this, what is about this? And when I struggle with some things that always went back to the cross, is that cross true? Did the Lord die and come back in three days? 
was he raised from the dead? And absolutely it's true because hundreds if not thousands of people were slaughtered for that truth. How, how can they say? I knew the Lord and then be sentenced to death. It must be true. Uh, that's the power in the cross. And when I am struggling, I can go back to that. I think looking back, that's one of my biggest draws to, to the missions field. Um, I don't know that I'll be used for anything else other than spreading this message for the next few years or till I die. I don't know, but my, my, my girls have, have decided and we'll see what the Lord does, but they would like to be on the mission field um, in the near future. They're seniors in high school and they're working towards uh, their, their college path should be putting them on the mission field. And that's what they've chose. So Lord willing, and we'll see what happens if that's what's going to happen here in the next year. Uh, my daughters may be on the mission field. And I remember looking back thinking, oh, wow, that's the reality of, of talking about this and introducing your family and your friends and others. That fire, we need those workers. Oh, wait, is that going to be my daughter out there in these uh, hostile places where you can't even openly be a Christian? Well, it might be. And that, that is the reality. But <clears throat> I, I, I highlight that because of the power, I feel like, that that ties back to the apostles and the power that that ties, ties back to early missionaries. And it's something that I currently, in, the, in my, my recent time, recent faith, uh, such a celebration, but it really pulls uh, uh, me back to that's where I'm grounded is the cross. And if everything else, if I'm questioning anything, if I'm floundering and struggling, I can go back to that truth. I, I did want to take a, a second to highlight one of our, some of our good friends, this poor, poor gentleman on, on Ron's right there. Um, uh, the man in the middle, he was, he was a Vietnam vet, uh, special forces went out there and he decided, um, came back. He's actually an Arizona resident. Um, well, he lives in Thailand now and he has been there for whatever, 40 years. But anyway, he, he felt a call on the Lord to go to Thailand with a backpack in 19, whatever, 70 and go serve back to give back to the people that he feel like he wronged so badly at that time uh, in Vietnam. And so fast forward this, it's who his ministry that we were there helping a few years back, that general on his right was also a, an undercover Christian. That general, that man was what would be the equivalent of probably the sheriff in a large town but he was also military and he kind of ran that area. And just recently within the last month, we found out he was jailed probably for all the things he's been doing for the Lord underground. He's been helping to sneak food and supplies and Bibles for years. And uh, yeah, he's still in jail. And that means he probably won't be coming out. Um, so that's probably his death sentence, but <clears throat> It still happens, you know, today, right now, there's workers everywhere um, that are being persecuted and put to death uh, just for saying they know Jesus, and I'd like you to know Jesus. Um, but it's worth it, right? Because that is the li true life-saving message. That is the life-saving message I have. That's the second chance I got, um, which I hope to never have to have a second chance again, <laughs> right? You only get one second chance. Is that how that works? Um but uh, to see folks who would walk miles barefoot to go to hear a message from, from a brother, uh, you know, whether he's an American or, a, you know, European or whatever, in, in Mur Burma jungles, that these folks are, are getting that chance um, in Africa. And we have workers there and we have folks in, you know, Nate Bramson, as you probably know, and we have uh, Dorothy from our chapel who's in, in um, Africa and just to know that that's going out and, and, but it has to happen here too. I get to, I can get onto these grand ideas that this is where the Lord's work is being done. No, that, that work's being done in my heart here, right here with my family. And I, I and I, I have to bring myself back to that and no, uh, that's my first mission field. And then we can serve out. Uh, I do have something that I'd, I'd like to share. Um, for me, in the most recent years, is 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded, 
be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour someone to devour. And it's something that I have to remember often because I need to be in the word. I need to have accountability with other men. And uh, it's the same thing I, in the recent years with Ephesians um, in the, the armor of God. I'm not going to go into that. That's a whole month to six month series we could do, right? But for me, that's powerful. That image that, that that represents to putting on that armor. And I know when there's a chink in my armor. I know when a piece is missing because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. I'm not telling on myself. I'm not in reading daily. I'm not prayer in prayer. I'm not fellowshipping like I should or, or serving like I should. There's something off. And I know when that happens and that full armor is off. So I, I hope today that my words were an encouragement because it doesn't matter where you come from. The best family, the worst family, everyone can be saved. That's for sure. Uh, he can save some hard-headed, knuckle-headed, alcoholic Marine like me uh, and give me the blessing that is my family and then use that blessing to bless others and continue to sp spread that gospel message. I feel like that's the chance and, and the gift that I've been given. So hopefully that's a testimony that gave you some of my early life and my current where, where we're at. Um, and I, I didn't get to talk a lot about Claremont Bible Chapel and why we got there, but I will tell you what draws me is that true, just like here, that, that small family, that intimate place where you serve together, you have people who know you, and they know when you're doing wrong, and they're willing to call you to account for it. And the brothers will come around and say, hey, you need to be careful. You need to do this. There's a reason for elders. There's a reason why this design is here. And we really do see the value in that. I wish, and I'm way out of time. I'm sorry. And I wish I could talk a little bit more about that. But the draw that was, is Claremont for us. And these, and, and, and I guess in general, the, the bigger assemblies is this intimacy that you, that you know each other, that this is the church that I feel like closely what God intended in, in, in acts and, and, and to say, we're here together. We're, we're, we're serving together and everybody has a part and we have to hold each other accountable. That, that was huge for us at Claremont and is. So I really thank God for this hard couple of years we've had. And even before COVID, I mean, the shutdowns and all that stuff, Claremont uh, was that beacon for us and, and the friends and, and believers there that uh, have just in the last few years helped to grow me, my family, um, and, and by extension, Palms, you know, I, I feel like Matt uh, coming with, with thank you, uh, just getting to know him the last couple of years, fast friends, because I think of some of this common bond we have. And um, I am so grateful to be a part of Claremont and a part of you guys by extension. I hope to see you again very soon because uh, we come out here often. And, and and now when we come, we'll make sure that Sunday is a part of, of that trip. So I apologize for going long. Uh, I think I probably left out a few things that I, I wanted to say, but next time, maybe, maybe we'll get a few, five more minutes. Cause you know how long winded I can be. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come here in this great nation and just be able to freely share and just to give that testimony to help to spread that gospel message, Lord, in a, in a free place like this, in a loving, small place that is sharing this all over, Lord. And we, we are so thankful that we can do that and not be persecuted yet here and not be persecuted and put to death here yet for, for our belief in you. And we remember those brothers and sisters and other nations who are doing that on the front lines right now, Lord. And we, lift, we ask and lift them up. We, that you pray that, we pray that you are with them. And especially here, Lord, that we pray that as a part of that family, that we continue to in, in fellowship and, and in um, unity, Lord, that we would be able to spread that message, Lord, in everything that we do, in our actions, in our speech, in our thought, that we would represent you, Lord, that we would represent that joy and, and, and um, just the life-giving message that is the gospel, Lord. We ask that that goes out from all of this, from all of the things that we do, that that's what comes out of the fellowships that we, that we are a part of, is spreading the truth to those who would hear it, and hopefully that they would take that and know salvation and know you, Lord, and that we would all be together uh, worshiping you forever in the end. Lift up these prayers in this time in Jesus' name. Amen.